from an early age, almost since I can remember, I've cared about social and environmental justice and about the underdogs. On Netflix, we have actually a category that is underdog movies. Well, that's my husband. I didn't know there was such a thing, but. And, and the fact that we're not treating our planet very well is another thing that really stuck with me. And so I have a strong set of what I call my justice feathers. Justice feathers. And it's so when I see injustice, I get upset, and then my justice feathers get ruffled. And so this is a story about a time when my justice feathers got a little ruffled. And I have a prop here that I've been um, marinating on for several weeks here. Um, my sister and my mom often giggle about this time when I was much younger, and I was on a road trip with my sister Susie, and we're driving along, and suddenly this guy in a car near us, he throws a banana peel out his car window, like this. Banana peel out the window, out of his car. And I got so mad. I happened to have a banana peel in the car as well. So I told my sister, speed up. Speed up, not too much, but you know, speed up. So I shook this banana peel at him, and I said, don't litter. <laughs> don't litter. I'm shaking this at him. And my sister's laughing, you know. She's like, this is our Kim. This is what she does. <laughs> and so I, I just like to say that I'm still shaking the banana peel, but just at a regional and national level and on pesticide issues. <laughs> I'm saving bees. So Amira just asked me to talk about you know, what brought you to this path. So this is where I'm coming. I'm coming to the story of how I came to NCAP. It's been, you know, a life's path. It's been propelling me toward this work to protect community environmental health and to create a world where, again, harmful pesticides are not the norm. There are lots of alternatives. Um, we're looking for a world where we can farm and tend gardens, manage our homes and schools and parks with more ecologically sound and environmentally friendly approaches that don't kill fish and bees and other wildlife that don't poison our water and soil and air. A world where cancer rates in children are not on the rise. So going back to a little bit more of my history, my group, both my grandfathers on my mother and father's side were born to Portuguese immigrants. And they were from Madeira and the Azores, and also from an agricultural province called Alentejo. Maybe some of you have been there in Portugal. Many of my dad's relatives were indentured servants who had their ship passage paid in the late 1800s. Um, there, I believe in the Portugal at the time there were famines and, and the agricultural structures you know, devastated and people didn't have a way to, to work and make money and, and have food. So my family um, actually had their ship passage paid. They went around the Horn of South America to Hawaii and worked as indentured servants in the sugarcane fields to work off their passage um, on the ship. And they made very little money. In fact, I have the, the contract, the indentured servant contract, that shows how, how much boys between you know, 11 and 15, how much they worked and how much little girls and women, and how much they were getting paid. So I, you know, I spent a lot of time hearing these stories. And that shaped me and, and, and made me want to fight for, for justice. I spent a lot of time growing up with my mom's father, my grandpa Bill, and he lived in Wairika, California, Northern California. He was um, retired from the Forest Service at the time that I, you know, he was really in my life. And he was such a mentor to me because here I'm this little girl, you know, uh, my parents are divorced, I go to my grandpa, and he just takes all his time with me, showing me the coyote tracks and the deer tracks and what they look like, and, and taking time to instill this love of nature in me. And I begin to see how, how everything is interconnected, how systems are connected, how so important the environment is to our survival. And so he, he really helped me become a, a nature lover. And my mom taught me a lot about kindness and, and further strengthened my care for the earth because she loved plants and she knows all the Latin names of plants and 
Um, and ladybugs are probably her favorite thing in the world. <laughs> she collects them. Um, and so, you know, this this is what's really instilled in me, um, you know, this care for, for the earth and wanting to make a difference. And so thinking back about the famines and starving children, and, and the children that were my age at the time, it really affected me, and we had so much in our home, it made me really sad um, to think of those children who had no home and no food to eat. And watching those starving children on the television with their swollen, empty bellies and the flies around their big, beautiful, brown eyes, it just, it, it changed me, and I knew I had to do something. And I was 10 or 11, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was going to do something. And so those images stuck with me. And I went off to college, um, first person in my family to graduate from college and get a master's degree, so that was a pretty big deal. Um, I went to U of O, I studied international um, development, uh, international studies and cultural anthropology, and there was a class about world food, and I, I remember this, like, you know, like there are moments where you just, something clicks, and you just remember something from, that, that made you change the way you do something, like maybe you put you on a, a career path, and it, for me it was this book, 12 Myths of World Hunger. That book really changed the way I thought about things. It taught me that famines are really complex, that um, that uh, we're exporting our pesticides and an industrial system of producing food and telling the world it was all a miracle at the time. Meanwhile, farmers in nations like India and Africa were being sold seeds and fertilizers, uh, pesticides and other inputs that they couldn't afford. And more land was put into producing crops for export rather than to feed people. And many of the pesticides being sold were banned um, in the US. So what can we do, right? What, what, what it, that was what I was asking, what can we do? So I'd like to share a quote from the 12 Myths of Hunger that sticks with me and I think illustrates why the work of NCAP is so important and why, it, why I personally do this work. And the quote is, ending hunger does not necessitate destroying our environment. On the contrary, it requires protecting it by using agricultural methods that are both ecologically sustainable and within the reach of the poor. And that was, a, that was a game changer. So I go on, I earn my degree at U of O in International Studies, Cultural Anthropology, and then I worked for Holt International Children's Services. Um, and I went to Cambodia with Holt in 1992 right before the peace agreement was being signed and 20,000 UN troops were coming into the country to broker the first democratic election. I was 24 years old. I lived in Phnom Penh, Cambodia for 13 months and I think I drove my mom absolutely crazy with worry because I was so far away for 13 months and I didn't go home and there were tanks in the streets and curfews and. Um, it was a, a country that was coming out of years of strife and civil war and Pol Pot and horrific things that happened there. Many, many stories. If you've seen the killing fields, you have some idea. But I did learn a lot. I, I have a lot of memories from that time. And I think it's probably because at 24 years old it was really the time when I was starting to see beyond, outside of myself, to what was out in the world and what was happening to other people and how we live and how the rest of the world lived. And I was just, it was just blowing my mind. I remember seeing women and children who had just been repatriated from the Thai border and they were scared because they were coming back into the countryside that had so recently been, you know, full of landmines and Khmer Rouge and banditry and it was, it was a scary time. And they looked so vulnerable in their, in their houses on stilts with no doors. So traditionally women worked the rice paddies. But they had no tools, and landmines were everywhere, and the soil was still contaminated. They were relying on food aid from USAID and the United Nations. And food programs would give, a, like, a small pig. Um, but it was, 
difficult for them to find food for themselves, let alone, you know, uh, an animal. But slowly, programs, you know, lots of development, and, and, and just the people pulling themselves up by their own, you know, ingenuity, uh, women were able to start working again and landlines were being cleared. So those were the, the positive stories of that time. But going back to the book, 12 Months of Hunger, I felt like I was really witnessing what Francis Moore LePay, the author, was, t was telling us. Um, that in, in a hunger, it's very complex in, 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 in world food and food politics and international development politics, that large international development projects, big companies, many of them American companies, broker contracts with the United Nations to sell things like cars, mosquito nets, and other products like pesticides. And these may not always be what the country or people need, um, but that's what we have to sell them. I saw how our, our country exports our industrial and conventional model of agriculture to other countries where our local people are ill-equipped to grow food in that way. Tractors get stuck in the mud in the monsoon and rust. No parts are available, no one can fix them, and women are the ones that are doing the agriculture, but they're not, the, the tractors are not being marketed to them, they're being marketed to the men. So, you know, we export our pesticides and environmental and health problems. And so, after Cambodia, I worked for two more nonprofits, and I went to, back to school, I went to Cornell University, and I got a master's degree in adult education and agricultural extension, and, and then I decided that I wanted to really focus on being part of the solution in the United States to create a more sustainable food and agriculture. I really wanted to focus on alternatives to pesticides. Um, and you know, just to be fair, I would say that you know, it's true that most of the pesticide use in the country, in the US, is in agriculture. But we also have it in urban areas. And we, at NCAP, we work on both urban and agricultural programs. So we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So in 1997, I also began working for um, as a senior policy analyst for an organization called the Center for Rural Affairs. And it was based in Nebraska, and, work, um, and also I worked out of Oregon. And I traveled all around the country working with farmers and scientists to, to really try to bring the U.S. around to, to see more of a, a systems approach, an ecological approach to agriculture and to support more organic and sustainable agriculture that we need research um, to find new solutions um, that work uh, in organic and, um, and more sustainable systems. And then it was in 2003 that I met Eve Sorensen, right over there. It, it may have been luck or, luck or divine intervention bringing us together, but Pete is an amazing guy. He's worked in Congress. He helped pass the Organic Food Production Act. Uh, he, when he was working for the Carter administration, he's been an environmental lawyer. Uh, he has been a senator in the Oregon legislature, and um, and and he actually has been working with uh, NCAP longer than I have. So when we met, it was pretty amazing. We found so much common ground, and we got married. <laughs> Let me kiss there. And so now I'm saying that we are a super kung fu pesticide fire duo or something like that. <laughs> so he helps in Kapara. So, you know, when I when this position came open um, five years ago, I it was just like I was coming home and I was hired and I'm now the executive director of NCAP. That was five years ago. And it, it's just we've done so many amazing amazing things together with our board and our staff. And so just to tell you a little bit more, so NCAP's mission is to protect community and environmental health and inspire the use of ecologically sound solutions to reduce the use of pesticides. And for the five years uh, I've been here, we've done some really awesome things. I'm just going to tell you a few of them. Uh, we passed a law in Oregon to reduce pesticide use in schools. And uh, so far we've protected 40,000 kids from um, the changes that we've made to um, you know, use less and reduce the use of pesticides in schools. And there are lots of ways um, like prevention, exclusion, that you can do to not use, you know, um, have pesticides uh, impacting children's health because they are very vulnerable. Their bodies are still developing. And, you know. 
So we also won a lawsuit to better protect 27 populations of endangered Pacific salmon and steelhead um, from pesticides that it, it runs from Southern California to Northern Washington and into Idaho. Uh, and we helped obtain 39 co-sponsors on the Save the Bees bill that I'm going to talk more about in a minute. So just to tell you a little bit more history about NCAP, we began 36 years ago in 1977 working on healthier for, uh, forest management in western states with high concentrations of public forest lands. And in the 1980s, NCAP was party in a winning lawsuit to stop the aerial helicopter spraying of basically the herbicides that were using Agent Orange in the Vietnam War. We stopped that spraying in Oregon and Washington public forests. Our work has changed and grown to include more work with healthier food and farms, talk a little bit about that, protecting children in schools and families. And we work in low-income housing um, and working for uh, healthier wildlife like our salmon and bees campaigns. And so, I don't know how many of you have heard this statistic, but it's pretty mind-boggling. It has to do with one billion pounds Every year, one billion pounds of pesticides are used in the United States. Uh, and that doesn't include the nearly four other billion pounds that are bleaches and wood preservatives. So if you just think like conventional pesticides that most of us might know or may be familiar with in agriculture and gardening, that's a billion pounds every year are applied in the United States. At NCAP, we are launching a Break the Billion campaign to break the cycle of applying one billion pound of pesticides every year in the U.S. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do that is, uh, is to save our bees. And it's to support a federal bill. It's called Saving America's Pollinators Act. It's H.R. 2692, and there's more information on that table about it if you're interested. Um, I'm going to be uh, speaking a little bit more about that. So pesticide use has long been tied to food production. I imagine that all of us in this room are familiar with at least some of the arguments. I've alluded to some of them. You've heard the line that pesticides are necessary for to grow enough food if we are to feed the world, as Monsanto claims they are doing. And this sort, sort of messaging is very prevalent right now in our society. I imagine that all of us are also aware of impacts that pesticides have on the food system not only in terms of human health, but also damage to the soil and the water. And the, ex and the expense to farmers via the ever-increasing pesticide treadmill, in, okay. <laughs> uh, in which more and more chemicals are needed to you know, prop up a failing system. And of course, that impacts bees and other pollinators. There's really an irony at play here, and in that pesticides used for the purpose of crop protection are killing bees, and thus undermining the fundamental environmental function that bees perform, pollination, upon which many of our crops depend. If we read something like this in a work of fiction, we marvel at it, we call it poetic justice, but there's nothing fictional about what's happening. Throughout 2013, we've seen a continuation, and in some areas, an increase in bee death attributable to pesticide use. We experienced two dramatic bee kills in Portland, Oregon this past summer. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, one of which is now acknowledged as the largest bumblebee kill on record, where more than 50,000 bumblebees fell to their death from the blossoms they were pollinating on trees mistreated with pesticides. 50,000 bumblebees. These events are important not just because they are sad and preventable, but because they have serious reverberations throughout the ecosystem and they stand uh, to threaten the future of food. We, we all rely on bees. They pollinate over a third of the crops that are crucial to human society and quite a few more that we might be able to do without but probably wouldn't want to, like coffee. Coffee is pollinated by bees. <laughs> Also, the vegetables that we've been eating, some of um, on your plates and, and will be on your plates, the butternut and delicata squash, cauliflower, eggplant, onions, and tomatoes. They're all pollinated, and by different bees, like honeybees, bumblebees, solitary bees, squash bees, and that's just to name a few. As I understand from the Xerces Society, there are thousands and thousands of different kinds of, of pollinators and, and different bees. 
and they don't all stain, which I know some people worry about. <laughs> but it's clear to me, and I'm sure it's clear to all of you, that bees must be protected uh, from harm caused by pesticides. They are um, implicated in bee deaths. So while, just to tell you a quick story, while the 50,000 bees, you know, they die in the shopping parking lot in the summer, I got a call from Oregon um, Congressman Blumenauer's office asking us to work on a bill called Saving America's Pollinators Act. And we, we took that call and we said, yes, we will be working with you to protect pollinators from neonicotinoid insecticides. And I know that's kind of a word that is hard to pronounce. Neonicotinoid insecticides. That's a class of, of pesticides that are shown to be harmful to pollinators. So we launched our Save the Bees campaign and began working with Luminar and the Xerces Society and many other groups, the Center for Food Safety, um, on this. And we, we just call it the Save the Bee Bill. That's easier than the Saving America's Pollinators Act. So if passed, this bill would ban neonicotinoid pesticides and force the EPA to perform an evaluation, a reevaluation of their impact on bees and other pollinators. A task that is long overdue. Bees would be protected if we can meet our goals. So right now we are mobilizing the grassroots to put pressure on our House members of Congress to co-sponsor the bill. Like I said, we have 39 already. I want to say to thank our Washington Congressional House representatives, Rick Larson, Susan Dalbeni, and Jim McDermott, who all have co-sponsored the bill. Oh, yeah. And I just say, yay, yay. Our goal is to have 80 co-sponsors by the end of this year, so we're almost halfway there. Um, we're really committed to moving this bill forward, um, working on this national campaign, protecting bees, um, and we, are, we really need your help, your continued help to win. Uh, you're supporting us tonight by coming to this dinner. Thank you. You can spread the word. You can call House members who haven't been on. I have a congressional guide over there if you're not sure who is your member of Congress. Um, we need bipartisan support. As Miru said, these don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or whatever. They care about living. <laughs> I care about them living. So it really helps when you make those calls. Um, you can also encourage other family members who live in other states to get their um, uh, representatives to co-sponsor the bill. So it's all about all of us sharing the story and passing it on and, and asking other people to, to step up. You can tweet it. You can blog it. There's all kinds of ways to share this information these days. And our, our website is easy, pesticide.org. So um, our, I'm just wrapping up to say that the Save uh, the Bees National Campaign is a main priority for us for the next three years. It's going to be tough to pass federal legislation. That's a hard thing at any time, but especially right now. So um, we need all the help we can get. Um, your voice, your financial support, give what you can. Uh, our goal is to raise $100,000 to save the bees uh, so that we can really make uh, progress. So I want to thank you for listening to my story and for wanting to learn more and help saving the bees and how to reduce and eliminate pesticide use and create a healthier world. Our website, again, pesticide.org. If you yourself need alternatives, um, we have on our website a lot of information about how if you've got some kind of pest problem at home, in your house, in your garden, and, and have a pest um, applicator coming on a routine basis and you're concerned about that, um, there's a lot of alternative information on our website and we can help. So just to wrap up, I want to say thank you for uh, listening to me and you can um, speak with myself or Pete or Sahali or Sasha if you want to learn more about MCAT, how to save the bees, or if you're interested in maybe being on our board or, or being engaged in our campaign. So with that, thank you so much for your time.